Good morning, Guardy. Yeah, happy Monday. Welcome to Adam versus the man. We have a pretty stacked show lined up for you today. Monday COVID blocks are always fun when you've got the links of the whole weekend. And like right now, like I, I got to say, I am excited. I, I mean, for a lot of reasons, a lot of good things in my life coming together. But with this in particular, like I'm excited for America. I'm excited for the world. It's a beautiful thing going on to see that the COVID racket as a whole, like, and again, I, I'm, again, taking a very moderate position on this and that, yeah, there are people exploiting this. No shit. But the COVID racket as a whole doesn't seem to have uh, sustained momentum. It doesn't seem to be able to continue without government uh, continuing this propaganda racket. And it's you, you, we see it now like hitting its limits and falling apart. And it's very exciting. So we got a big COVID block today. We got Mary Ruert joining us at the top of the hour. We got executive producer Jim Freedom. We've got co-host Mercedes Damertowski joining us from uh, Nebraska. And then uh, there's we got a militarism block. We got we got Mike Tyson talking about psychedelics. Not on the show. In an article that we'll talk about on the show. I know we would be promoting it a lot more if Mike Tyson was doing like. The Libertarian Podcast Tour to promote his new psychedelics perspective, but we'll get to that. Jim Freedom. What's going on? Good morning to you. I just wanted to show everybody what I got while I was up north by Gardenia <laughs> last, the last weekend. All you need is love and a dog. And I got Falcor, so I got everything I need. <clears throat> it was a beautiful weekend up there. Um, uh, I hope everybody is keeping themselves involved. We got a public telegram channel. I don't know if you'd heard, but it's t.me forward slash Adam versus the man. Everybody watching live or otherwise is, is free to join that group. And we have all the links for all the news articles that we cover. And even the new dark news articles that we don't cover are in there. So you can check those out. T.me forward slash Adam versus the man. We also have a private telegram group that you can earn access to from patreon.com uh patreon.com forward slash adam versus the man has the different levels of the ways you can support the show one five ten or fifty dollars a month are the different support levels ten dollars a month will get you access to the private producers club on telegram which will also get you access to 15 percent off and free shipping on everything in our merch store once the website is up and running with that so definitely take advantage of that and get yourself involved after that, check out CigarFederation.com. Great website for all kinds of exotically flavored cigars, including a CBD-infused one they have called the JSK Nug. Uh, so definitely visit CigarFederation.com and use promo code ADAM10 to get 10% off of your entire order there. That's a great deal, so check that out. Uh, Instagram's got some new pictures on there. We got a new uh, picture of, uh, we'll, we'll call it, wisdom and experience and that's our, mm -hmm. our our good friend ed vallejo with the nice yes bling of the sun behind him adam adam took a few minutes right in the middle of our dominoes game to take this shot because it was just <laughs> a, a perfect timing the sun was coming through it he just he was sitting there and he saw the shot and he's like i gotta get this shot it's perfect and he took hey, it move. Like okay move seven. 10 degrees yeah. left Okay, move 10 degrees right. Okay, Jacob. Look up without Look. moving your shoulders. Look right. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. But they're great shots, man. So check out the Instagram at the Garden of Freedom. You always get good pictures and videos of life up there in Gardenia. So that's cool. Uh, the crypto6.com. Great website. So you can check out everything that was going on with those guys that got raided with the Bitcoin church uh, over there in uh, Keene, New Hampshire. They got a bunch of links here so you can write the guys that are still in cages. Uh, you can donate to their GoFundMes. You can donate through cryptocurrencies, help these guys out uh, with their lawyer fees and everything so they can get off and get back to Free Talk Live and uh, sharing the message of freedom. Lastly, our favorite website to send people to that are interested in learning about solar power and wind power and all that fun off-grid stuff GoGreenEnergyOnline.com. It's a great website with a great resource of knowledge. 
for all of your solar and micro wind power zero energy homes. If you're thinking about doing it yourself and putting up some solar powers, go to gogreenenergyonline.com. Click all the buttons on that website. Learn all this stuff. Get yourself educated at gogreenenergyonline.com. Awesome. And Jim, we had a great weekend here with you this weekend and the team, the founding members of Homefront Battle Buddies, finally, after months of getting ready and getting to this point and overcoming some hurdles, we had a great weekend bringing a group of veterans and supporters together here to create this organization, which I guess, I don't know, should I, should I flash the board? We've got some private notes on it. I'll just, woo, there's the board. There's, yeah, you can screenshot that. Woo. Yeah, there's our, there's, there's our organizational uh, brainstorming results of this last weekend. We walked away with some fundraising goals, big to-do lists, so on and so forth. So it's going to be a lot of fun uh, seeing that get the ball rolling. And a lot of people are asking, Adam, well, you know, it's Memorial Day Monday. Aren't you going to, aren't you going to celebrate Memorial Day by buying a mattress and taking the day off? And it's like, no, fuck you. What is Memorial Day? Federal holiday in the United States. We're honoring and mourning the military person who have died in the performance of their military duties. Well, gee, the people responsible for their deaths, the civilian oversight part of government, wants you to do it their way. I can think of no more inappropriate way to honor victims of government militarism than by saying, oh, oh, the government wants me to remember you today? So no, in actually doing something appropriate for Memorial Day, we're taking this opportunity to say, fuck you to the government. We're not going to recognize your bullshit holiday. And we're going to keep fighting you to make sure that there are no more unnecessary dead veterans. And how many are necessary? Zero. A big part in this sort of covert mission uh, of everything I do as an activist, you know, in, in, in really what is first and foremost really makes me as much an anti-war activist as a libertarian activist is to ensure that we are the last generation of combat veterans the world ever knows. And we're not going to get to that point if we keep kissing government's ass and letting them tell us when to do the right thing or the wrong thing or what days are appropriate for celebration and more honoring what days are appropriate for saying fuck the government oh wait the only days that are appropriate to say fuck the government are days of the week that end with y and with that co-host mercedes damratowski joins us to let us know what our comment contest for the day is and what we have to look forward to with mental health monday mercedes how are you doing this morning? i'm doing well thank you nemesis is upset because um Matthew went to my father's with Cora while we do the show. So he, he, um, he's going to get some new uh, rims and tires for his Camaro, I believe. I don't know what he's doing. He just left. But she's mad. Um, so I actually, we didn't, I wasn't decided on the comment contest before the show, as you know. And I decided today, since it's Memorial Day, and I feel kind of melancholy because government makes me sad. Government told you to be sad, so you will obey and be sad no, because no. today is Memorial Day. That's not what I mean. I'm sad because I have always, up until like about five years ago, I always got on my Merca bikini and my boots and go to the river and grill and be Merca because redneck things. And then uh, kids in cages. And I'm like, oh, I can't be patriotic as long as there's fucking kids in cages. Like, it was, you know. And so I'm like, well, f fuck, <laughs> I'm going to have to be anti-government on Memorial Day in, in revenge for all the veterans that they decided needed to be happened. Anyway, you know what I mean. If, if I may, Mercedes, on that, it, it's like getting out of a toxic relationship. You're going to miss the good parts, you know? No. And... Uh, when it comes, yeah, sorry, uh, you know, yeah. stuff that tricked you into getting into the toxic relationship in the first place. Uh, uh, but, we learn from those <laughs> to to apply this to government uh, in that simplistic angle is still very appropriate, right? To say, you know, it's, you're getting out of a toxic, you're, you're psychologically exactly divorcing yourself from a toxic relationship with government, and you're going to miss the good parts. But if I'm going to raise the analogy that way, I have to point out that your relationship with government 
is much deeper than that with a spouse or a partner in a toxic relationship in the sense that it's more like a parent. Especially and when you're a child and then you're involved with the parent or uh, family law and the state is who saves you and then you grow up and they take away all your programs that they used to save you and then they Mexican joker people. And even if you're not conscious of it, yeah. and even if you consciously fight it, there is something deeply ingrained in the human psyche that has been taken advantage of our entire lives by the systems we live under to exploit that little programming vulnerability that has now inserted the institution of government in some way in our minds in a parental role. It has come to occupy that space. And all of us as libertarians have to divorce that, have to give that up when we recognize its illegitimacy. But what that does because it allows us to really become fully actualized adults and not live in this stunted state of citizen, of, of, of immaturity, of, of being dependent and beaten down and prevented from realizing your potential as, as, as an entrepreneur, as, as, a, as a family member, as, as a, a parent, as a lover, as a, all of these things that essentially require that free human will to be fully realized that is in so many ways stunted. And I, I say it by government in general, but like really especially as it relates to militarism and public schools or government schools. No, um, it is it is deep. It is deep. So we'll come back to all this with Mental Health Monday. But what what is, uh, let's see, oh, Rob. Oh, wait, oh, yeah, I'll put it back in. Uh, government uh, government is, just, is just, go ahead. Do you listen to people that do not have your best interests at heart? Um, they just want us to be happy for the children. It's all for the children. Uh, as and Colette just did, uh, hi Colette, uh, just gave all right. So what, but anyway, what's the comment contest today is the best joke at the government's expense. <laughs> we say one liner for comments because there are a lot of good stories. You know. Okay. You yeah. 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 No, it has to be a joke. Liner. It has to be a joke. It needs to be well structured and formed. It has to make us giggle snort at the government's expense because I'm sad and the only person I get to bully is the government. Thank you. All right. Yes. Yeah, well, it's all right. Def de defensive ridicule, you know. They it, violate the nap. I think you saw this when you were here, Mercedes, that the, uh, the desktop background on my computer is the John Lennon quote. Uh, when it gets down to having to use, oh, I'm uh, plugged in. Whoops! Ah, here it is. See, oh, I got geez. this. I, I, <laughs> oh, oh, it went out. Oh, it's the government. I, I made this graphic myself. I didn't see that when I was there. No, I didn't. Desktop background, uh, and it says, "When it gets down to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard." Flick your face to make you fight, because once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor. Hi, and I, Q, Vermin Supreme, Adam I, yeah, I really need to learn how to read this in a British accent. Uh, if I do a British accent, it sounds like a John Lennon impersonation to me anyway. I so, can't. I... And unless I'm doing the Queen. I, I can't write. My voice is... Like, I, don't, I think it was... Like I had one rough weekend last weekend and my voice, like it sounds fine. It's just, I, if I yell, it hurts. And I know it's like, it sounds a little, a little more rumbly than normal, but I doesn't, doesn't hurt to do the show. A little tiring. So we did have a super chat. Um, I did air yes. it while we were talking. It's a $2 super chat. Um, I'm not going to attempt your name because I will screw that up. Here in Bifidum. Yes. Okay. Sure. Whatever you say, man. And I under I often wonder about the free staters and then a follow-up con comment. Who are they and what are they about? Yeah, I mean I check and encourage everybody to you know Google Free State Project or or Bing it or use some better free staters would be like, how dare Adam tell people to use Google right. to find us? Internet because search. they they are the uh, oh. one of the most principled pockets of libertarians of people who have decided to vote with their feet to New Hampshire to concentrate libertarian activism to make one potentially free state. I'm technically a member actually, and I, I joined in college and uh, made the pledge to move with the caveat that like when I can afford two homes and it's retirement and New Hampshire, you know, successfully secedes from the union, 
then then I'll move to New Hampshire. But I'm definitely a big supporter. Been to their main uh, parties, uh, Pork Fest every year. Uh, uh, I've done about half a dozen of those. And they used to do Liberty Forum uh, speaking events when I lived in D.C. And I did a few of those. It was a lot of fun. So, yeah, I especially if you're in the New England area, especially if you're in driving distance of New Hampshire, please check out Free State Project. So uh, I need some COVID vitamins, dear. Do we have COVID vitamins? Yeah. Oh, look, I have a fresh bowl of COVID vitamins here. Thanks to G.I. Mary Jane in studio with, the, with us this morning. Any final thoughts before we launch into our COVID block, dear? No, only <laughs> make sure you take your vitamins and remember the best defense against government is puppies. All right. When well with that, we have that. let's let's we have uh that. take our COVID vitamins and dispense with some misleading medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a big, big, big block of COVID. We're going to have, like, there's a lot of stuff, like, I really wish we could just get into in depth because so much about this narrative to pick apart, so many ways it's being exploited indisputably. There are, there are elements we can dispute. It's not, are we being ripped off? Are we being scared so that we can be taken advantage of? It's how much. So what are they doing now to manipulate the public? Cron4.com. San Francisco, Bay Area, new study. People are more willing to get vaccinated with cash incentive. Oh, really? You need, no. you need a study for that? No shit. No, it's uh, to determine how much money it takes. How much, is, how much does it take? Now that, because, you know, remember first, people were scrambling to get the vaccine. This is a major turn. It's going to remind people this longer arc in the whole narrative is that when the vaccines first came out, there was a portion of the population, I don't know, off the top of my head, maybe 10%, who were like scrambling to get it, right? Who, who had some reason or were still like for their work or were scared and didn't, see, didn't do the research for themselves about the side effects or didn't realize, hey, new vaccine, you don't have a real reason and you can continue to practice hygienic isolation for a few more months. Why not just wait and be careful? Because, oh, now, now I'm the crazy one because I'm saying, be careful, right? Gotcha. So with this uh, narrative is, is, is being forgotten, uh, this new norm, like, is is, is uh, of, of paying people to get the vaccine is very unusual. Okay, there was there was a first wave, people enthusiastic to get the vaccine, and then government came in and said, okay, now we're gonna make it free, and now. We're going to make it. And then they got, they got another, I don't know, 10, 20%. Uh, although we've seen some studies, as many as 70% of Americans don't plan on getting the vaccine. It's like, there's this, there's this you know, like, I talked about like the bifurcation of the economy when the forced unemployment crisis came in. There still is this growing split, right? Where there's the gray market and black market, which is the nonviolent versus the red market, white market, the official government sanctioned, violent dominated market. And now there's there's this split in in realities too almost, and it's not it's there there was like a, this polarization that you could look at as kind of a left right thing, and it's weird because this is now making libertarians genuinely aligned with conservatives to some degree. Maybe just because Trump was president when this whole thing or happened, right? Uh, yeah, but there is a a new bifurcation of people uh, who and and you know that. The Republican Party is sort of losing its sycophants to the COVID bullshit. Oh, well, we're, we're finding out. In the, 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 we used to call them neocons. Now we can call them Covidiot Republicans, right? Covinos? I don't know. I'll stop. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we're at this point now where they have to pay people. And I don't think they're being entirely, I, I mean, when government promises you money, and, you know, honestly, there is a point where I would say realistically, like, if you don't want to have kids, if you don't have any particular reasons to think that you're vulnerable to a particular vaccine side effect, you can afford to take a day or two off of work to deal with potential side effects, of, you know, typical flu, whatever. And the government gives you a thousand dollars. 
do it. I'm like, like yeah, fuck yeah. Take it. I mean, if the government offered you a million dollars, I would do it. I would do it for a million dollars. I would make to me. I mean, a thousand. Eh, I probably wouldn't because I have vulnerabilities. I have like I have genuine allergy concerns where like, and I want to have kids. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so like, there's those two things, and I plan on living for another 120 years or so. With those, but if those things don't apply to you, right? If none of those things apply to you, and the government offers you a thousand dollars to take the vaccine, and you can choose and make sure that's one of the relatively safe ones, do it. Ten thousand dollars, fuck yeah. If it's related to your job and it's that scale of calculation, yeah, do it. Uh, if it was a million dollars, yeah, please do it, and then donate some to us, right? But, <laughs> but uh, there's, it's, it's. I'm not trying to put this, you know, out of perspective or blow it out, but this is what they're doing, and the incentives now. But here we go to the story at cron4.com. A recent study done by UCLA reveals that cash incentives, such as $100 payments, could persuade more people to get a vaccine. In the survey, about one-third of unvaccinated people said cash payments would make them more likely to get the COVID-19 shot. Now, here's the exciting sub-headline of the story. Again, bifurcated realities, people who believe authorities and people who know better. One third of unvaccinated people said cash payments would make them more likely to get the COVID 19 shot. Turn that around for a second. Two thirds of unvaccinated people said, You can pay me and I will still say, Fuck you. I am not taking your shot. Yeah, two thirds. Now that's unvaccinated people. So we've already filtered out the like vaccinated, you know, authoritarians who, who, who jumped and, and rushed to get it. Right. And that's fine. I, I want to point out here, important sidebar though, the splitting here, the government has come in and used health as the wedge and lies and misleading people. And if you fell for that because you have a bias for believing authority because you haven't studied history, then you're in that camp. And they genuinely have taken what might have been nothing more than a funky off-season flu. And turned it into, and it, or or even if it was a real threat, they have taken maybe what what was, and and that is a real threat. A funky off season flu is a real threat that will kill millions of people on a planet of eight billion. Yeah, it's because the flu kills forty thousand Americans every year anyway. So, with that statistical perspective, and then you go, well, why did this one become the dominant issue that required this huge response of all the things that kill people? because there were enough people who stood to gain and even at a deeper level the, the the people like and i have people who i know personally who i've seen go this way in the healthcare industry who were just kind of you know can i go authoritarian or freedom i i don't know i'm just kind of going along to get along i got a good job whatever and then covid comes along and be oh oh i'm a frontline worker they're making <laughs> memes about me <laughs> they're making superhero memes about nurses and uh, hospital workers and even the janitors. And it's like, <clears throat> you don't think that's going to sway people? Fuck yeah, it is. You know and what this is? This is like in dare class in school when they're like, people are going to come up to you and they're going to offer you free drugs. And that never happened. And now, now it's oh. happening. They're offering <laughs> free drugs and they're offering to pay you to take the drugs. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's that like that a drug dealer trying to get you hooked. Yeah. Government we've got people are going to offer you free drugs. <laughs> they're they're going <laughs> they're going to use peer pressure <laughs> to try to get you to do drugs. <laughs> they will be wearing suits, taking government paycheck. Oh wait, no, no, never mind. We left that part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, very good. I didn't take dare. I didn't. I didn't do that. Well, it's funny because you know I did. I didn't. Uh, I mean, we did like drug education, you know, where, where I grew up uh, a little bit, but like I didn't fall for that at all. Um, but I fell for the sex ed bracket of like, be afraid of sex. I was a virgin until I was 19, you know? Um, I mean, I fell for most of the drug, anti-drug bullshit too, obviously, but not nearly as hard. <laughs> uh, doctors say providing cash incentives to motivate health behavior isn't anything new and has been successful in the past. Oh, you mean we don't need coercion in government? We can just gently pay people and 
work to to get their compliance and convince them yeah no shit uh but this is government money of course a a will exercise is a leading cause of a healthy immune system exercise that yeah i mean the, the whole suppression of exercise and healthy human connection and just getting out uh during this thing is is a, is a really i we are going to be looking back at this for decades as a social engineering experiment WashingtonPost.com. Oh, I'm sorry. If you have a benign view of government, you might call it exercise still. But no, at that point, we, we will know better. Excuse me. The Washington Post, 22-year-old on becoming America's first vaccine millionaire. I thought it was a prank call. And yeah, this is this is it. It's got Mike DeWine, governor of Ohio, just calls Bugensky, Abigail Bugensky, out of the blue. Yeah. He said I had won a million. Like, so imagine this regular civilian going along to get along, got the vaccine for work. Suddenly, hi, this is your governor, Governor Mike DeWine, uh, governor of Ohio, and just won a million dollars. Like, I can't even get through that and, and keep a straight face. I think if I was Governor DeWine, if I was doing this call for real, I don't think I would be able to keep a straight face and be like, we're doing this, <laughs> we're doing this vaccine giveaway <laughs> thing. Like, no, 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 I'm serious. No, 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 this is, I'm, 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 this is Governor DeWine. No, I'm fucking serious. I'm fucking serious. We're giving you a million dollars. If this is even real, right? Because then I go, how much would the government have to pay someone to pretend they have won a million dollars. And and generally, when you win a million dollars in the lottery, you keep your name private. Do you want your name out there if you're a millionaire? Does anybody know this lady? You need to get in touch with her. All I have to say to conclude this segment of our COVID block <laughs> is that when government promises money, you should wait till you receive it before you count on it arriving. To the airplane block, CNBC, this headline is from last week, I think. Uh, I thought it was really cool, that uh, reflection of my story and so many others I've heard. And also, bifurcation of realities. Do you, because because uh, private companies, especially with governments backing them up, like airlines, be, you know, become authorities and have part of that psychological role implanted as parent in our brain. CNBC headline, Unruly behavior from plane passengers has never been this bad, says flight attendant union chief. Well, maybe if you didn't all become Karen tyrants of the sky, ready to bully every passenger about mask policy, you wouldn't have unruly passengers. No, you don't have unruly passengers. You have victims of corporate bullying on behalf of government. No shit. Yeah. Now, related headline today from also cnbc.com southwest pauses plan to resume alcohol sales after flight attendant uh assault okay the actual headline here from not the link that's still loading on my laptop <laughs> american southwest put off plans to serve alcohol after passenger disruptions assault on board Even from my, Joey, even our experience flying on the plane, flight attendants, whether they know it or, or not, are being directed by airlines to illegally enforce COVID policy in violation of individual rights and individual health components of the laws they are claiming as the basis for their authority. I have so, empathy for them. They don't even know. But you know what? No, this is this is calling out the Karens. It's serving to expose them. And you know what? I hope the shitty ones uh, learn something from their experience, at least. Now to Idaho. Fun little incidents in Idaho over the weekend. This headline from IdahoPress.com, May 27, briefly serving as acting Governor McEachin, issues order forbidding mask mandates, including in schools. Yeah, so... Lieutenant Governor Janice McEachin serving as acting governor today because Governor Brad Little is at a Republican Governors Association conference in Nashville, has issued an executive order forbidding any government entity in Idaho from requiring face masks, including public schools. And you go, oh, that's freaking awesome, right? And now here's the funny thing. The headline follow-up today, 
Tyranny. This is from IdahoStatesman.com. Tyranny. Idaho Governor Brad Little repeals McEachin's ban on mask mandates. Idaho Governor Brad Little on Friday repealed Lieutenant Governor Janice McEachin's executive order to ban mask mandates, a move the governor called a self-serving political stunt that amounted to tyranny. Yes. You have to give people the freedom to be tyrants or else that's tyranny, tyrannically preventing people from being tyrants. Yeah. Interesting little back and forth here. Is it self-serving political stunt? Now, technically, is it tyranny? In a sense, it is for government to mandate that a business or dictate that a business not be able to mandate masks or mandate no pants policies in their establishments if they shall choose. So uh, to ban mask mandates. Now, for her to do it to government agencies and to say that governments will not support mask mandates, that would be entirely appropriate. So who knows how this really plays out. If you're in Idaho and you want to let me know if, if something else comes to this, please do. Otherwise, I don't really care. It's just a fun sign of the times from Idaho. Bloomberg, MSN.com. Seychelles COVID mysteries pit anti-vaxxers against scientists. And the funny thing is anti-vaxxers is not a scientific position. Anti-vax is, a, at this point, the way it's actually been redefined by Merriam-Webster.com is someone who opposes, at least this is what I've seen. Maybe they changed it again. Politicized dictionary? Yeah, welcome to the future. An anti-vaxxer is someone who opposes forced vaccinations. What kind of inhumane asshole is not an anti-vaxxer by that definition? Someone You have the right to force a vaccine on someone else? You have a right to require them to not be around you or in your community. You have a, But to be a pro-vaxxer is to be for forced vaccinations then apparently at this point. But in Seychelles, it's the most vaccinated nation on earth. Uh, 64% of the population having required the requisite two shots. Yet this, to the surprise of virologists and the dismay of the government, which had been counting on the immunization drive to reopen the tourism-dependent economy, the infection count has been ticking up. As of May 13, a third of active cases, about 900 all, were among residents who had been fully vaccinated. And somehow they want to be able to use your freedom to go around Disneyland unvaccinated or unmasked as the incentive, another corporate kickback to the individual to make you want to get your vaccine. Study finds out, or we have to breeze through the rest of these really fast. Nearly half of COVID-19 patients leave hospitals in worse condition than they arrived. So if you have COVID, you know those places where people go to be sick and die? Probably want to stay away from them. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. And I bet this doesn't even cover uh, those who were killed by inappropriate ventilator use. And I mean, I, I, I hate to say I told you so. Uh, but there are going to be a lot of those, and this is going to might might be uh, a, a cathartic, uh, a, a, a catalytic kind of event for humanity coming together and going, "Oh shit! Remember that time we trusted the authorities instead of reason and logic and evidence?" Oh, shit, yeah, and a lot of people died unnecessarily. So we're going to get to some headlines with that today, of course, in our. Uh, in, our, in the rest of our COVID block, CBS local from Miami, fully vaccinated, no masks required, no, fully vaccinated, no longer need masks indoors at Universal Orlando Resort starting this weekend. Mixed feelings about this, right? Remember, like with all massive government focused packets, they don't just get defeated and disappear. The people profiting from them are going to let them go as slowly as they can. It's a big part of what we're seeing. KPTV.com. Confusion, concern, consequences surround Oregon option for separating vaccinated from unvaccinated. By now, many Oregonians have heard about Governor Kate, ba Kate Brown's new plan to allow businesses, venues, and places of worship in low-risk counties to serve more people. It's an option to create separate sections for those who are vaccinated and those who aren't. I mean, there's... The idea is that unvaccinated people will be required to be socially distant and masked while vaccinated individuals will be free to gather closely without their masks. There's an element of medical discrimination here. And, and I'm sort of, you could say, a cusp case 
for wearing a mask for medical reasons. Like, yes, I, I've been advised based on my allergies, I probably should avoid wearing. Like, if I have to wear it to go through a TSA checkpoint, it's not going to hurt me to wear a mask for a few minutes, but that I shouldn't can wear it continuously. And and I, I if, if the vac if I fell for the whole racket to begin with, I would want to be among the vaccinated. I would say, hey, let me into the vaccinated club. I have an exception. I say, no, you have to be out in the awkward cold with the unvaccinated mask and distance. This is part of them continuing the effort to bully people into taking the vaccine. And the more, the longer this goes on, the more I think there might be some other significant incentive besides the ripoff and making money by big pharma because there have been, I mean, these are conspiracy theories at this point. They're doing it to, to provide mass, uh, to, to create uh, a massive sterilization effect. No, I, I, I'm really skeptical of, of these conspiracy theories. I doubt that. But I, the more I see stuff like this, I'm starting to think. And, and just looking across the lens of the history of government, mm, there's something else to this. Wall Street Journal the Great American Reunion, COVID reopening vaccine summer. Pull this one up, Jim. It's uh, not loading on mine here. Um, another story from the Wall Street Journal about this summer uh, being one potentially of violence. The Great American Reunion families and friends are coming together after long separations as vaccinations rise. My God, we're back. So that's the move. But skipping ahead. There is still the unshakable reality of the consequences of the vaccine itself, let alone coming out of all of the uh, economic, social consequences that the covidiots can say, well, that's worth it. So we go next to the sun.co.uk. Devastated. Lisa Shaw, BBC presenter 44, died from blood clot after having AstraZeneca COVID vaccine in her family said. A brilliant BBC presenter died after suffering a blood clot following the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. Her devastated relatives told of their heartbreak, saying there's a Lisa-shaped hole in our lives that will never be filled. Well, goddamn it. I hope we learn all the lessons from these stories. <laughs> J Post, the Jerusalem Post.com. Yes, what cures might they be keeping from us? Ten serious COVID patients given Israeli drug leave hospital in one day. And this, this, this is like, I, I talk about big holes in the narrative. Oh, we live in a modern, globally connected world where governments are all taking this seriously and working together to make sure our COVID response is as effective as possible. Are you kidding me? How is it that treatments like this are available in some places and not others? Now, a year plus into this pandemic, pandemic, whatever, you really just now we're sharing treatment results. It, it is Def, and I would predict that there are going to be more stories coming out in, in, in the years to come about various cures and treatments being suppressed, let alone studies and manipulation of data, blah, blah, blah. Reuters with their next headline, WHO at Heart of World's sluggish response to COVID faces potential shakeup. Interesting. The racket, the conspirators, the, consp the conspiracy of conspiracies includes conspiracies that compete. Surprise, surprise, the WHO may be shaking under its own power plays. WKRN.com, more hat makers cut ties with Nashville Hat Shop after a controversial Instagram post. Yes, surprise, surprise. They want to make it available to have a hat. With a star of David that says unvaccinated. Can you get that picture of there, Jim? Just a quick fun headline about vaccine divisiveness. From Reuters, UK vaccine passport plans to be scrapped. That's right. They are not going to be able to get away with it. Oh, yeah, there's the actual protest. No Nazis in Nashville. No, the funny thing is they're, uh, they're, they're saying like that the, I mean, they're using the star of David to say, hey, remember when we marked people? For religion, well, now you're wanting to mark people by requiring them to wear masks for their biological situation status based on your droplets could be a threat. So uh, to Reuters, yeah, to see this, this is this plan being scrapped. Uh, this is very exciting because 
It's we are you're, what we're seeing is the racket, the racketeers hitting the limits of what they can get away with. Now, the next story from CNN.com, uh, I believe, is the actual one that our our title of the show is based on. Oh no, it's MSN.com. The next one. Sorry, I'm having some internet connection issues here. It must be Verizon throttling us again. Am I on the hotspot? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's the jetpack. Um, I'm not. Thanks, Verizon. Thanks, government. Uh, but yeah, we have we have some couple more fun stories here. Skipping that to MSN.com from the Washington Post. Officials worry the rise in violent crime portends a bloody summer. It's trauma on top of trauma. The mayor of Albany never expected to spend her days attending funerals and comforting the families of those killed and injured in a spate of alarming gun violence she finds hard to explain. No. No, 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 no. It's not hard to explain. It's hard to admit responsibility for. Because at some level, you knew what you were going along with when you went along with this whole COVID racket. You knew that there would be unintended consequences. You knew that your knee-jerk support of authority would allow those who use that authority to exploit people to do so like never before. You knew that in some ways, as people like me and so many others pointed out, the cure might be worse than the disease. And when I and so many others stopped to look at this and said, well, how much worse? You never bothered to ask that question, did you? And I'm speaking not just to the mayor of Albany, but to everybody in that position who went along with it, who recklessly followed authority and therefore contributed to its victimization of your fellow Americans. From the Epoch Times, scientists discover what may cause COVID-19 vaccine blood clots or linked blood clots. At least that science is coming along. Washington Post at MSN.com, resistance to vaccine mandates is building a powerful network is helping. Oh, it's the legal network. It's, oh, it's the, it's the shadowy group behind it. No, it couldn't possibly be because, well, this next headline from, uh, let's see, CNBC, you know, Wall Street Journal, why a grand plan to vaccinate the world against COVID unraveled. The multi-billion dollar COVAX program was supposed to be a model for vaccinating humanity. But is it problem after problem? Oh, and it's just, it couldn't possibly be side effects. It couldn't be possibly be dead celebrities after getting the vaccine. It couldn't possibly be, oh, your side effects are going to be worse than COVID itself for a lot of you. No, it's, it's just this shadowy group of conspirators going, oh, yes, we're crazy anti-vaxxers. Yeah, yeah. CNBC.com with our next headline, something that we predicted and have been looking at, and it may be coming finally now. Later than I predicted, I must admit, CNBC, millions of Americans could face eviction as housing protection expires in June. What's the number here? More than 11 million Americans are behind on their rent, and many could face eviction when the national housing protection expires in June. Housing advocates say the ban is lifting at a terrible time for property owners and tenants alike, with states still scrambling to distribute $45 billion in rental assistance. Oh, yes, scrambling to give away money. But there's another effect here for those people who live in reality and work jobs that don't have the benefits of working for the man or sick days and paid leave. Those of us who are entrepreneurs, business owners, work for ourselves, contractors, or simply day laborers, the Washington Post, concerns about missing work may be a barrier to coronavirus vaccination. Just the fact that you might get sick from the vaccine and miss work and not, and then miss bills and then miss grocery bills and not be able to take care of your family. There is a sort of basic undeniable reason why this is a significant cause for vaccine hesitancy. Now, our co-host Mercedes said that she had so many words about this story. So as a segue to our Mental Health Monday, we're going to play out with some COVID vitamins 
and then get back to Mercedes. <laughs> Ah, Mercedes, Mental Health Monday. Thank you so much for putting some great articles together today. Did you, did you want to share some of the many choice words you had? Oh, of course, sex workers, drug dealers, people in the cannabis industry. Also, that might be, well, they might be hesitant to get the vaccine because those people tend to know that government is full of shit, but also because you can't just afford to take a couple of days off on your own if you get the flu, like symptoms from the vaccine, right? Yeah. Yes, Adam. Uh, which which first news stories? It was the first one in the list of the stories with the things, right? Because well, I have the last happened. one about about is sex workers, for example. Sex workers, there have been, there's been a great division on this. We saw in Brazil prostitutes protesting to say, give it, we're vulnerable, give us the vaccine first. Uh, and it, it, it would make sense that even in that community, the majority would be essentially pro-government, right? But there's going to be a number who would say, I can't afford to take a few days off work and get the flu. Maybe it's not prostitutes who generally are making enough money to have some work schedule flexibility, but Mexican immigrant day laborers, restaurant workers, bus boys, servers, bartenders, like I'll just tell people I'm vaccinated and rough it because that's a bigger risk than me getting the, get, you know, that I might get the shot and have to take a day or two off work than the, than the, the COVID disease itself. So quickly, because our guest is backstage and I don't want to, you know, well, should we get to Mary first and then come well, back? Let and me rant. We'll, stack we'll and do some, some comments. Since you brought it up, we'll do a quick rant about it in five minutes or less because right. I've had COVID. My grandfather passed away from COVID. It's affected us. We know it's a real virus. We know it's been used as a weapon psychologically within our communities in order to sow division because the facts have not been readily available in an honest way, which is part of the misinformation campaign and propaganda that the government uses to keep us afraid and divided, first and foremost. Thank you. Secondly, if we could get this story up quickly so I can show the graph. The graph is the most important part of the story because um, you have to look at where the where we are as as a society and where our priorities are when it comes to getting sick. Like you said, people can't afford to lose work, whether it is with COVID or because of the side effects of COVID vaccine. Um, because the side effects of the vaccine mean scientifically your body's having a reaction which means that your antibodies are being produced which means that it's doing its job congratulations if you get covid you're not going to die potentially because we don't know we're all guinea pigs right now which is what we all need to remember is we don't have any scientific definitive data to back up anything right now because we've only been exposed to this for a year it wasn't handled correctly in the beginning so now we're still playing catch up in the data to try to filter out what's real what's not what's going to be like <sighs> nothing it's just exhausting which is why it's five minutes or less in this rant because <laughs> i am so tired of speculating and not actually just looking at the scientific data and listening to the adults in the room who dedicate their lives to the fields of studies in which this is connected to um and um so like the the 76 percent of the people who were interviewed were their number one reason why they didn't want to get the vaccine uh, is because of serious side effects. The second one was safety concerns of the vaccine. The third one is missing work because of side effects. That means our economy sucks. Thank you. And then it goes privacy, getting the vaccine from a place they trust, potential out-of-pocket costs. Most vaccines are free, by the way. They're giving, you're, like you said earlier, they're paying you to take the vaccine. They want you to get it. Um, and then uh, taking time off to get the vaccine. Well, hold, on a hold on a second, Mercedes. Yeah. They don't want to pay you to take the vaccine. They want to trick you into thinking they're paying you to take the vaccine. Oh, really? yeah. It's, all, it's our money, money anyway. From? Yeah, I forgot. They're it's ours anyway. You, oh, yeah. That's, right. oh, oh, your that's money right. right. Big pharma uh, and the government. Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> it's Mental Health Monday, and I have not had enough 
coffee. <laughs> I'm taking it easy. I'm trying not to let it get away from me because, you know, when dealing with government and talking about COVID like this, it just, it's, you got to be aware of your mental health or else we're going to look like aliens. Oh, and segue real quick. Anthony commented in the comment section if we could do, if he would do a shout out for his son, Sander. I didn't want to lose a comment. And I just remembered that I wanted to tell you that. So I'm going to look for the comment, but if you could say hi to him, that'd be great. Hi, that would be great. <laughs> oh, shit. Hi so to him. That would be great. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. Yeah, no, All I right. lost the comment. Uh, anyway. You're so, <laughs> thank you for being here today. Any other critical comments I missed? I don't know. I'm going through them right now because I went on my rant and we have four more minutes. So two <laughs> minutes and I'm out. Um, well, somebody said I'm not lying. I don't know if they're talking to me or not, but that's cool. Thank you. Um, oh. We did have some really funny comments. Um, I'm not sure where they're at. I hate. Here's this. If everybody, the comment could, section. if everybody could write an email to StreamYard and complain about how they do their comments. No, we studio. want we want one feature added to Streamyard, a comment clipboard. Oh, there it is. So our producers and co-hosts backstage can put comments on a clipboard and bring them back during the show because we can make jokes about bringing comments back and back. But said so we said we have kind of a limited basic functionality of a stream and can only see like what's there and pop them up. So feel free to repeat comments sure. if you feel like it's critical and you want Mercedes to get it on screen today, especially yeah. in our next segment with our guest, Dr. Mary Ruer. Harris McGrade, love some Mary. Oh, they look at that. Thank you. Um, I want to know eye to eye, uh, your lady has gotten it COVID or gotten it the vaccine? Um, I like Colette's answer. Or, you know, yeah. or, it, that's, Oh, this is not wholesome content now, Adam. I uh, don't give a toss. It's a germ warfare. I, I unofficially second that for safety purposes. I know nothing because I'm a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't know. What I mean. You okay, know, it makes uh, me easy. so this lab thing and Rand Paul and 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 or I should say Dr. Paul, Senator Dr. Paul and Dr. Fauci oh. going at it with the you know could it have escaped from a lab narrative gaining you know at least mainstream credibility. I wonder if that's a ruse and a distraction too because <laughs> they could set that up as the fight, right? That's the fight over COVID. Did it come from a uh, lab? Or, right? Yeah. Not how oh, should we respond to it? Right? Oh, should we respond with coercion? Or should we respond with peaceful, cooperative means that respect individual and basic human rights? It, yeah. it doesn't matter because we have two more minutes into the guest is here. Ida, I <laughs> said that his lady works at a hospital. She had no choice. She works with cancer patients. Um, and so he said it's the vaccine she had, not COVID. And in that case, if she got it, there's a lot of healthcare workers that are very skeptical about it. So if she could please document everything in a scientific manner it's for science, that would be a great, great uh, thing for humanity and the scientific field as a whole. And, and I should point out for a lot of healthcare workers who do, imagine you're a healthcare worker who hasn't fallen for this racket, but you you're still tied into the system and you know need to get the vaccine in order to keep doing your job. It's a shitty position and it's a it's a question you gotta ask. And I, I don't fault anybody in that category for everyone, you know what? I'm just gonna get the vaccine because I have this compelling reason for my job. Then I've already made I already made the sacrifice of saying I'm gonna take a daily like and this sucks. You wanna be a doctor. If you wanna be a non-alternative medicine pregnant, you wanna be a light, you wanna be a surgeon, you wanna prescribe controlled pharmaceuticals in America, you have to fill out a certain number of government forms and, and sacrifice a certain amount of your freedom. If you've already made that choice, taking the vaccine is, is, is probably not that big a deal, you know? And so I get it. It just sucks that you're in that position to, to have to do it for your work. And people in the healthcare industry are going to face the most intense pressure, obviously to get the it's, vaccine. So I with just, that, yes, it's time to go to the guests and, uh, bye. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Dr. Mary Ruert, someone who was hugely influential in my libertarian awakening, someone who has had that effect for millions of libertarians throughout the world. She's actually a retired biomedical researcher and longtime libertarian activist and author, presidential candidate for the libertarian nomination in 2008. And I got to say, not only did I, I wish you'd won it then, but I, I wish you were running in 2020 
I, I would have been happier to lose to you than anyone other than Joe Jorgensen. Uh, and you're uh, especially in 2020, we've had some conversations. Uh, Dr. Ruard has also been uh, very influential in, in my understanding of COVID. And, and I, I do think back to our talk from very early in this pandemic and, and how I developed you know, my own analytical framework and understanding how someone like you approached the, the hygiene uh, pressure or or increased incentives and so on and parsing all of that out. So we're going to get to that and, and and all your thoughts, hopefully on you know updating us on where you are now in in terms of the pandemic a year later. But I know there are a lot of people who are thinking like and and I don't know how you feel about my platform and localization and you know what you want to see happen with the LP in 2024. But I, I along with a lot of others are right now really excited about the possibility of you running in 24 regardless of your platform based on how, because COVID's still going to be way too darn relevant going into 24, whether we like it or not, having a doctor at the top of the ticket for the LP would be pretty exciting. So uh, Dr. Mary Ruer, thank you for joining us. How are you doing this morning, dear? Well, I'm happy to do so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's, I, I really want to jump into this, you know, first update. It's been a year you know, how have you been through this whole past year of COVID? I mean, I, I don't, it's been about a year since we spoke uh, last on the show, I believe, uh, at least with that first interview sort of setting out, you know, your perspective on COVID and your personal protective posture. So will you, how have you been? How have you dealt with all of this? Well, I've been very fortunate. I live in an area that wasn't very locked down. So my, and I work from home anyhow, so my life didn't change that much. Luckily, I, I do all my consulting from home, uh, but that's not true for others of my friends and family. And so I'm very sensitive to the fact, as you were saying earlier, that for example, our healthcare workers are forced into it, which isn't surprising in a way, because healthcare is the, one of the most highly regulated um, areas, you know, really in, in this country. So I'm not surprised that they forced the healthcare workers into it. And even so, my understanding is there's still about half of the healthcare workers who have refused to take the vaccine. And I mm. think they're concerned about safety. And, and you know, there's a reason to be. Um, the VARA system, which is where data is collected about the side effects and deaths due to the vaccine, specifically- Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Yes, yes, and, and of course it's voluntary. So there's been a couple studies and what those studies showed is that only between one-tenth and one-hundredth of the adverse effects are actually reported. Now, so yeah. far COVID vaccine, yeah, it's been like 4,200, probably a little more. That's, I saw that one about two weeks ago. Um, so 4,200. So if you multiply that by 10, and now we're at 42,000. If you multiply it by 100, we're talking 420,000. So probably somewhere in between those mm -hmm. two numbers are the number of people who have died from this vaccine. Although one might, wow. yeah, one might speculate that people are being more religious about reporting side effects. But actually, I've seen interviews with people who have had you know, serious side effects, not death. Um, you know, they've had seizures, something close to Bell's palsy. It's last mm -hmm. months. Um, and they basically say that their doctors are either saying it's not due to the vaccine, even though it happened within 24 hours or even sometimes within hours of getting the vaccine. And, right. and others are saying, their doctors are saying, yes, it's due to the vaccine, but we don't know what to do for you, which of course is very <laughs> Oh, geez. Well, uh, Dr. Rora, th there are a couple practical questions I want to ask about, you know, blood clots and, and side effects and, and viral shedding and things like that. But first, what, what you hit on in, in, in terms of perspective, I want I want you to go back to this for a second, because you said that there was a, a about one in a hundred or one uh, vaccine side effect events are being accurately reported. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, they're not, of course, the two studies were not done on the COVID vaccine. They were done on other vaccines and the reporting rate was either one out one of every hundred or one of every 10. So, you know, if you use the conservative estimates, that, that's 42,000. Uh, you know, there has been speculation that maybe 
maybe more of these side effects are reported for the COVID vaccine, but I don't think so at the rate that at the rate that doctors yes, are not that, admitting to it, you know. So that's, I, I, <laughs> that's what I'm getting at with my question. Can you contrast for a second or a minute here the the the, the, uh, the way in which the vaccine side effects are being very deliberately under, like the system is engineered, you could say, for vaccine yeah. side effects to be underreported, and it's engineered for COVID deaths, consequences, long haulers, serious everything. And I think that everybody who's a, who, who's a, who suffers from psychosomatic symptoms loved this one, right? All, all yeah. the hypochondriacs out there. You know, you get counted in these numbers, right? That uh, these numbers are inflated while these numbers are suppressed. And it sounds like, you know, half a million dead Americans total maybe uh, is what they're claiming. We know it's it's down like to some fraction of that. But if, if you're saying that it could be 420,000 dead from the vaccine, hypothetically, based on a hypothetical extrapolation, right? That we could say literally at this point, the cure is worse than the disease, not even counting all of the social and economic impacts. Is that fair? And, and, and what, what, what else would you say about that contrast and well, statistical if you, pressures? Yes, if you use that number, that only one out of 100 are reported. Now, again, you know, it's kind of difficult to know for this vaccine because, you know, there's, of course, it's been mass vaccination. So one could imagine that maybe they're reported more frequently uh, than they normally would be for a vaccine. In normal vaccine practice, um, you know, there's been, I don't know, there's this myth out there that vaccines in general are, are really don't have any side effects. And this simply isn't true. They're just like any other drug. They have side effects. And of course, this technology we're, that we're using is new. So we really don't know as much about it as we'd like to. And we don't have any long-term safety studies. And the reason we don't is that it got emergency youth author use authorization. And actually, you might be interested in this little piece of information, Adam. What, what I found out a few days ago is that the um, emergency use authorization has a uh, document, which you can look up, has a clause in it saying that uh, nothing can get that authorization if there is a cure or treatment available. And I always wondered why ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were being so bad mouthed. And of course, <laughs> it, it, it seems that one could certainly speculate that the reason that happened was so that the emergency use authorization could go through. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't doubt that this is a very big possibility because the FDA has really been co-opted by the pharmaceutical industry since, uh, which started in about 1992 when there started to be these um, user fees that pharmaceutical companies had to pay to get their um, approval re or their drug proposal, shall I say, um, reviewed more quickly and the reason they now, could now, now mary mary i, I want to interrupt for just a second to ask you to sidebar and brag on your credentials a little bit specifically okay. about your book uh death by regulation your 2018 book that i i turned into the bullet point of the fda has been responsible for tens of millions of deaths by its manipulation of drug markets, approving unsafe drugs and keeping effective drugs from the market. Uh, incredible that you put that together. Can, can you comment on, on how your background as a biomedical researcher and writing that book influences your analysis of COVID, please? Sure, well, my professional credentials are a bachelor's of science in biochemistry, a PhD in biophysics and a postdoc in surgery. I worked for the Upjohn Company pharmaceutical firm for 19 years. And what I saw there was the evolution of the 1962 amendments, which didn't really start to take effect into the 1970s. I was hired by Upjohn in 1975, um, or I'm sorry, 1976 and left in 95. So I saw how these amendments to the Food and Drug Act of 1962, actually, if you look at all the studies and put them together, have shaved five to 10 years off each of our lives. It's pretty dramatic, and that's because the time it it's takes- It's not pretty dramatic, it's fucking criminal and offensive. And what you've done for the, for the movement of people fighting for health freedom 
is is given us a, 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 a statistical perspective that government would literally kill to suppress because it shoots to the core of the racket of the government-based manipulation of the medical industry. So thank you for that. You're you're welcome. And like I said, I, I could see it happening in the industry, but I, I even I was surprised by how the numbers were. I, I hardly believed it. I had to go back and really, you know, like check the estimates of what the drugs on the market do today in terms of saving lives, because that was obviously a critical part in this calculation, because there's a delay, um, you know, before the amendments, it only took about four years to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. After these amendments, by the turn of the century, it was up to 14 years, a whole decade more. And you know, the AIDS patients knew they couldn't wait. So, uh, you know, they actually were importing drugs from overseas. They were they were actually hiring black market chemists. How does the Dallas Buyers Club not make everybody who's, who's seen it hate government for killing AIDS patients? Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, a lot of your listeners probably have uh, have seen the award-winning movie Dallas Buyers Club, where you saw. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. How can you not see that? How can yeah. you not see that and be come to that conclusion? A lot, and it's sad that a lot of people don't have the courage or the initiative. But your work in connecting these is critical in that. So back to COVID here for a second. The pressure on the potential variation of vaccine adverse event reporting versus reality looking at the past being 10 to 100 to 1 that's already a very big gap and i think what you were saying was that this could go we could go either way it could go down to 5 to 1 hypothetically if we have way more adverse events reported because there's hyper awareness on this but it could uh, it could go down by another factor of 10 and be a thousand to one because of the uh, 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 suppression of the reporting. I is it really that variable? Can you give us any more guidance on that? I mean, it's five to a thousand times. Is it, do we have, is that the best we can do right now? Well, I can only speculate because, you know, I, I can't, I don't have a firm grasp on how people are reporting COVID problems to this system. Right. Um, I would, I generally tend to be conservative. So I would say if, if somebody pressed me to the wall, I would say I would go with the one to 10 rather than the one to a hundred. But I'd say it's at least on that low side of the historical range. Yeah. Yeah. You know, of course I don't know. Cause there, there could be more reporting going on just because there's such an awareness of COVID. Um, so it could conceivably be less. And, and again, I'd only, I'd have to speculate to, to say what I, you know, I only would have to guess basically to say what the reporting is. What I can tell you is that there are deaths from the vaccines. We don't always know what they're due to. We can't identify the people who are going to have these effects. And that is where it's really, really difficult because if you go in to get a vaccine, you don't know if you're going to be one of the unlucky I'll say few because you know still um, if you if you say the one to five or I'm sorry the one to ten uh, you know forty two thousand okay so COVID's killed more than the vaccinated but you know there are other things you can do and that's what I've done uh, you know I haven't taken the vaccine I saw one of the comments come up asking would I would I take it if I were pushed to the wall well you know the only way I'd be pushed to the wall is if it prevented me from flying and I don't fly that much anymore I think I would probably instead of taking speaking engagements would probably uh, just take the you know webinar approach like we're doing now uh, but you know I think I think Mary, I we'll get you around the country in my bus <laughs> yeah that's another idea so um, I don't really I don't really anticipate having to make that choice and um, you know, there are there are exemptions. I'm not sure if I qualify or not. I'd have to see. But um, I've, you know, I, I take vitamin D, which is an important factor in whether you'll survive the COVID or even get it. And then, of course, the um, preventative things, melatonin, um, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. That's been that's been my regimen. And of course, I try to stay in good health. Um, and I, you know, I've taken many, many vitamins and things of this nature. And, um, you know, for my age, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> no kidding. So with this, uh, 
potential for the vaccine to be much deadlier than is even commonly understood just based on underreporting of deaths and side effects. Um, my general, I, I have to ask if my general perspective or advice is still applicable, applicable because I've been saying the vaccine is dangerous. The vaccine has side effects. The vaccine has these potentials for long-term effects that we don't know about. But in terms of all the things in the human experience, it's relatively safe. If you have a serious incentive, like you can't fly and you have to fly for work or you're you're like you know you're in a, in the medical field, and I, I'm I'm really encouraged to hear from you that 50 percent of healthcare professionals still haven't. But I would imagine in hospitals and clinical settings, emergency rooms, that number is is a lot higher than 50 percent, where the pressures are high. You can't be around patients in an emergency situation if you haven't gotten vaccinated during the pandemic. How dare you know? I mean that kind of pressure. So. Uh, is it still okay? Would you would you kind of back me up on that advice that like, hey, avoid it if you practically can, but if you have a strong incentive and you're reasonably healthy and you've done the research and you, you don't want to have kids, you know, that's not a concern for you, then maybe it's okay to get the vaccine. Well, you know, technically, because I have a PhD instead of an MD, I am not legally qualified to get something. <laughs> <laughs> I can only say what I do. <coughs> All right. So, so, you know, so given, given that legal disclaimer, her advice will be put in terms of this is how I see it. Yeah. Well, I told you what I actually do. And, you know, I, I don't know what I would do if I, I know I have uh, relatives that have uh, autoimmune diseases and they don't take the vaccine because they're concerned that that could be aggravating to those autoimmune diseases, which is probably as far as we know today, the biggest, I would say the biggest disincentive to take the vaccine in terms of pre-existing conditions. Um, the other thing is this is new technology and there is now some evidence coming forward indicating that this spike protein that the vaccine uh, encourages your body to make it in and of itself has some toxicity. Um, again, that's not real firm yet. That data is just coming out. And I don't know if you've seen the YouTube videos where people are putting magnets up to their arm where they've been vaccinated and they stick half wow, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Is that real? I saw that and I was like, ah, that could just be some silly video trick, Frank. No, I, I think it's real. It was investigated by a, a news source that I tend to tend to trust. Not everybody has that, but of course, you know, when you put something in your arm, it doesn't necessarily stay in your arm, it can move around. So, uh, you know, there are things we don't understand. There's some talk about the spike protein crossing the blood brain barrier and the spike protein itself being toxic. Again, these are early studies. So I, I wouldn't say that we know all this for sure. And this has been the problem really with the whole COVID thing. We don't even know what the flu does, let alone this COVID virus. So this is the first time we've really studied in depth the COVID virus. Uh, I know you were talking earlier about whether this is man-made or not. I saw a pretty credible presentation by someone who indicated that um, there were certain parts of the spike protein that um, probably w could only be there if they were man-made, a piece of uh, HIV protease, um, the, um, uh, the prion part, um, a prion part, and of course, you know, the prion is the, is one of the substances that causes mad cow disease. And there was a third part, I, I'm not recalling right now what it was. Um, and so this, the person who presented this was pretty convinced this meant it was man-made. And that has always seemed to be a pretty reasonable conclusion to me. Again, it's still being debated. I don't want to mislead anybody and tell them that this is the gospel. You know, I'm I'm telling you the best that I am aware of from the data that I have seen, and I do try to keep fairly current. So, this is my understanding at the present time. Okay, just a couple more practical questions here. Uh, you know, for shedding, do we unvaccinated have something to fear? from the vaccinated now that they have made themselves toxic, both literally toxic, but biologically toxic because they have this potentially harmful you know, spike protein and mRNA in them. 
And what do you know about that and, and blood clots? Uh, because the rumor that I've heard that, I, you know, and this is one of the things that this, it, it pisses me off to no end that this is a rumor that we don't know, that bears, we don't have something more effective or a better conceptual system that allows us to understand this kind of stuff, that women are reporting that there are unvaccinated women being around people who are vaccinated, having then uh, menstrual blood flow and clotting issues. Can you speak to any of those things or anything else, any sort of practical individual uh, advice that, that you would want people to have at this point about COVID? Yes, there have been reports of women who are not vaccinated having alterations in a menstrual cycle, which incidentally does happen with the vaccinated people. Um, th in fact, that's probably happened more than was originally thought. I, there is a website where you can report if you're having that, and I, I don't recall it right now, but if somebody in your audience really, really wants to know, I could probably dig it out for them uh, after the show. So um, as far as I know, you know, there is a theoretical reason to think that there could be a problem of shedding from vaccinated people. What the vaccination studies show is that you have fewer symptoms if you get the virus and probably you don't get the virus as often, but it's a little hard to tell because the way the study was done, it took symptomatic patients and tested them for COVID. So if they were asymptomatic, of course, they didn't get right. didn't get. Yeah. So, so um, theoretically, though, since you would expect the symptoms to be less, you can imagine that there might be more asymptomatic people among the unvaccinated, I mean, I'm sorry, among the vaccinated and the unvaccinated people exposed to that could be more susceptible to getting COVID from carriers that are asymptomatic. Now, of course, there's a question of whether asymptomatic carriers actually do spread the virus to any great degree, because if they're asymptomatic, presumably the virus is in their system, but it's it's pretty weak, you know, it's not. Right. So it might not be, may or may not be an issue. It's a theoretically theoretical possibility. Okay, so let, 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 me, let me ask you in, in a more practical way then, like to, to what is the actual concern? And maybe for me as a, relatively relative i can still call myself relatively young right okay relatively young pretty healthy dude like i you know pretty maybe there's no practical considerations for me but what if my partner and i are trying to have kids do do i need to protect her from vaccinated people do i need to protect myself from vaccinated people so that i don't possibly pass something on to her that's a good question. And the answer is we don't really know. I think probably if you're both healthy, mm. that you have a low probability of getting affected in a way that would influence your children. But the truth of the matter is long-term mm. studies haven't been done. They haven't done safeties in pregnant women. Uh, they haven't done safety, you know, they haven't even done animal studies as far as I know. Uh, to test that. And that's something that today, because of the thalidomide tragedy back in the 62 in Europe. We were just thinking about that. We were doing that just came up this week and we were like, do people not remember thalidomide? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, actually today we generally do test drugs, pretty much all new drugs for the possibility of, uh, you know, of fetal harm. But um, this obviously hasn't been tested for that. And the sad thing we is we have time for that during a pandemic. <laughs> well, and we've had some children actually die from the vaccine, which, you know, the children have almost no possibility of death from, from this. So, you know, I don't understand why they're pushing it on the children. I mean, it, I mean, except for a monetary profit maybe, but I mean, as far as health care, it, I mean, a number of doctors have spoken out on this and are refusing to give the vaccine to children in their practice because of that. It's it's really, it doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of potential for harm for the children, but not so much potential for any kind of benefit. So in fact, you know, this whole thing, it, it's very interesting. I chair an IRB. An IRB is a special ethics board that's put together. Um, and, and when you do experimental trials on new drugs, you have to tell the subject that's gonna take the drugs 
all of these different things, you know, be, because of the Nuremberg trials. You have to tell them they can quit any time. You have to be careful not to coerce them into doing the study. You know, there's a lot of things that have to go into that informed consent that they get. And the IRB reviews the informed consent and makes sure everything is in there. Well, you know, this is because this is an experimental vaccine, uh, one could argue that, um, especially with children, giving children the vaccine, and in some states it is possible for the children to get the vaccine without parental permission, of all things. And so, and, and, not, and not even informing the parents. So this seems to be a big ethical violation to me um, because again, the, mm -hmm. the risk of harm is so much greater for children than it would be for an adult say that, you know, maybe had some comorbidities and was afraid they were gonna get the virus and, and have a problem. So it just doesn't <clears throat> make sense. It, it seems to be an ethical violation. So we've only got a few minutes left here. If anybody has quick comments for Dr. Ruler, but of, of the que or questions, uh, of the questions that I've seen uh, uh, for you so far and, and, and around us in the comments, uh, they're kind of getting at, well, what do we do then? You know, and and I, and I and I, and I, 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 I mean, there's that, but also with the last few minutes of the show, uh, J.M. Adrian, please stop giving your children experimental drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, do we, so, we have to say that? Well, um, I would say get outside and get some vitamin D, natural vitamin D. It's, it's, it's everything I've seen suggests the natural vitamin D that you get from the sun is better than taking a supplement. But if you can't okay. get out, well, take a supplement. That's that. <laughs> That's not what these questions are about, doctor. We know, like most of us, you know, we're parsing out some of these things with the, how, what is the threat of the vaccine? How do we manage this policy? What is the threat of the vaccinated to the unvaccinated shedding, things like that. But we're, we're all pretty health conscious. I, I, how will it affect your brain? I don't have your thoughts on that. But I, I want, I, with the last few minutes of your time that we have here, I mean, unless you have some other critical practical advice you want to share, I, I want you to answer these these big social political questions now, you know, okay. as libertarians. I think a lot of people are looking at you, especially for 24, going, <laughs> what perspective, if you were leading the LP at the top of the ticket in that, in that role in, in 24, you know, or you were advising whoever was that nominee or you were advising the movement as a whole, or, or you are advising, you know, the, the, the two thirds of Americans who are now at least won't even take money to get the vaccine. What do we do to fight this bigger problem? What do we do to push back? What do we do to make sure that this whole COVID episode is, is, is put to bed as quickly as possible and that as many people learn the lessons from it as can? Well, as libertarians, we have the ethical, moral high ground, in my opinion, and that is personal choice. You know, we have to be able to choose what we put in our body because once we let the government choose, they can put anything in there they want. They can put drugs to make us docile. <laughs> you know, we won't even know. So it, it, this is not a trivial issue. This is an issue upon which our freedom really depends. And I've, I've said for a long time, healthcare freedom is the issue of this decade. And here it is. Here is a big one. And it's sad that I've seen some libertarians who think that we need to vaccinate ourselves to protect others. <laughs> but our health is our own responsibility. And I, from what you've said, your listeners get that. And so they really need to help, especially libertarians, <laughs> see that that's the case and not, not think that we have to do things to protect others' health. We have to protect our own. And We'll do it better than anyone else. All right. Well, quick question. Pork Fest is coming up pretty soon. I don't have plans, but I don't think I'm booked. Mary, any events you have coming up you're excited about? Well, I'm going to Freedom Fest, and I'll be talking about my book, Death by Regulation. So if you're going to Freedom Fest, I'll be there. Um, and let's see. Um, well, of course, I'll be at the Ally Liberty International Conference in Columbia. Uh, 
yeah, at least that's the plan so far. It's in August. And I encourage you to go to our website, liberty-intl.org, and learn more about it. It's going to be really exciting. We have a great lineup. Also coming up from Liberty International, for those of you who don't want to travel, is Liberty Solutions 2.0, where we're going to be talking about how you, as an individual, can have freedom in an unfree world. And it's going to be really exciting. There's going to be some really exciting data on life extension uh, studies that are happening now and how, you know, how they actually have reversed aging in animals and how they're doing it in people. So you don't want to miss this. Well, hey, Alex, thank you for a one dollar tip super chat. I'll take that as a, as a thank you applause to Dr. Ruard. Alex Vandalay, what will it take for either of you to come to Pork Fest? Email me, Adam at the com. We'll see if we can make something happen. I don't know about Mary, uh, but the ways to contact her, she landed and all that. You know, Dr. Ruard, one, I, just one last thing uh, I, I want to underscore uh, that you said here, because in your answer there, it was, it, I, I might summarize this. Take this as the opportunity to uncompromisingly advocate for absolute health freedom, that you as a human being own yourself and your body and your health belong to you. And there's no compromise in that whatsoever. That is an inviolable ethical principle. But also something you added as kind of a footnote to that was to just help people be healthier. And it's something that I like I, from teaching other younger college kids how to lift when I was playing rugby to, you know, giving advice on the show to, to helping people out here to learn how to lift and teach. I mean, this is, this is my, uh, my, my health credentials are that I, I take a ton of vitamins. So, um, you know, tell you about why and how and, you know, the process for all that. And I would just encourage people to see that what, what, what Mary is advocating is not, you have to figure out some big solution to the problem, but just be a positive influence. If you're healthy, if you're fit, if you're capable of helping others achieve that, you look like, I mean, it's the gym owners in New Jersey who are leading civil disobedience here, right? It's the, it's the, I, I predicted this at the beginning that there was going to be a meathead revolt and it's, yeah, the fitness enthusiasts are going, no, nah, because and if you can make people, if you can empower people by showing them how to take care of themselves, to be fitter, to be healthier, to be happier, they're going to value that. And that is the most important thing you can give someone. Political stuff just follows afterwards, right? Sure. Well, my mom always said, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And that's true, because if you're not healthy, you can't do anything. You know, it's really tough. And there's the website, ruert.com. Please check it out. Dr. Mary Ruert, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, you're welcome. I, I'm hoping your listeners will go to my website on the lower right part of the page. You can see all my social media, which is much more up to date than my website. <laughs> all right. Check it out. Check out her books. They're great work. And we look forward to everything else you have to offer, the party, the movement, and humanity. Thank you very much, Dr. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your attention, everyone. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was fun. Let's get back to Mercedes for Mental Health Monday. Mercedes, this was a story I mentioned on Friday. And I knew you were going to have some words for this one. But you didn't see it as a mental health story. But I'll bet you do right now that I pointed out unheard. And that's unheard like H-E-R-D, like oh. get out of the herd. Unheard.com. Um, and, and I, I, Susan Lipscomb, I don't know anything about the source, fun story, but interesting how it points out the trend. It is why are women becoming witches? <laughs> Humans have always turned to magic when they feel, remember I asked Joey this to guess when they feel helpless. You see that that is a, a mental health issue when people feel helpless, turning to mysticism, to magic. And, and I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm passing joints, not judgment on this one, right? Uh, if this is what, what what gets you high, you know, playing with magic, you know, I, I don't believe in magic, but I believe in, you know, the value of witchcraft. I believe in, you know, the connection with nature and the occult and the, the observance and connection with what is supernatural, not because it is unnatural, but because it are not part of nature, but because it is beyond the realm of human comprehension. 
But when people are becoming witches because it's cool and trendy and they're fucked up because of COVID and they're desperate and they're helpless, I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah. So in my experience in the things with the occult, because let's be real, I hang out with people that play in the occult. That's what we call it. It's the occult. So um, first and foremost, in this article, because I did read it, uh, well, okay, while well, you were talking about COVID, because... You know, that's what happens when you talk about COVID so much. Uh, and they mentioned the TikTok. Yes, yeah, sorry. They mentioned the TikTok, which is, which I was actually aware of. Because I was on TikTok a couple years ago and they censored me. And so I'm like, fuck you guys. Uh, you're Chinese propagandist anyway. I'm not going to play with you anymore. And then I heard about the witches of TikTok doing hexes on people. And, woo, and I'm like, first of all, first of all, first of all, amen to Mara. G.I. Mary Jane, uh, amen. First and foremost. Weed is magic. I will weed say. is my, it's magical. It takes me, it lets me vibe out. Uh, so there's this one time that there are witches of TikTok doing hexes. And I'm like, okay, first and foremost, if you want to believe in magic and that it's real, you believe that there is light, dark, and in between, and the rule of three, and sending out bad juju comes back as bad juju and like bad ways. And like I myself, as a practitioner, I like rocks and jars and nature. And I am of the opinion that uh, witchcraft is science that hasn't been explained yet in a lab. Yeah, we worship the cannabis plant because there's so much awesome shit we don't understand about it. So we stand in awe <laughs> and <laughs> worship a sacred plant just to recognize. And I say that that's a petty the burning naturalist bush. example, cannabis compared to, we, we look at the moon, we look at the sun, we look at Mother Earth and we go, you know what? There's, in recognition of the humility of this organ here and between my ears, I'm just going to say this is fucking sacred. See, but they've been finding evidence of marijuana being burned in temples as far back as like <laughs> thousands of years ago. So You've it's. Of being kind of I'm sorry, but didn't Moses go up into the mountain and find the burning bush? <laughs> Burn some bush. Mm, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, if you haven't seen the epic rap battles of history, uh, Moses versus Santa Claus with Snoop Dogg playing Moses and, and Santa Claus making fun of him for, I think you need to go back to smoking some of that burning bush. Uh, yeah. That, anyway, to wrap up this story. Yeah. So for the witches, um, like the story, the witches story highlights uh, Brie Luna as an example. And I'll just give you the sources on this Instagram at the hood, Witch, where she has 472,000 followers. And her website, thehoodwitch.com. If you want to poke around in this trend, please check it out. Uh, but Mercedes, I wanted to get your thoughts also on a story we touched on last week from Reuters. From suicide to eco-anxiety, climate change spurs mental health crisis. Yeah. And it's like, this is, you, th you talk about the manipulation of the left for their good intentions. God, they're so right? good at using the emotions to do the thing with the propaganda. Yeah. Is, there, yeah. is there anything more to it than that you would say about legit? I mean, do we have, I mean, I would say we, we don't, we don't have any legitimate reason to worry ever. Don't worry. Be happy. Bobby Darren figured that out a long time ago. That's all you need to know. Right. So worry is like, worry about it. like if you find yourself worrying, Stop, listen to that song, and then turn your worry into positive, productive concern that you can happily go about thinking through and executing and coming to some empowering conclusion from. So, like, do we have some existential reason to look at this threat? And if we do, can we separate that from this political racket of hyping up climate change as an existential threat, whereby if you don't vote Democrat, you're a bad person and you hate the planet? I think that we as humans need to be re be mindful that we are keepers of the earth and we do impact the, the planet around us. We know this because we have scientific evidence to back up the fact that humans can fuck up an environment. Hi, oil spills. Um, so I think that as someone that has anxiety, generalized anxiety, PTSD and stuff like that, I have the ADHD, whatever. And and I am kind of a hippie where I'm mindful of our like topsoil and agriculture and stuff because we need to eat. Um, I can see where the anxiety is coming from. I can see that climate change is happening. I can see that things are changing. I'm not saying that it's 
never happened before because it has scientifically speaking climate change has happened it's just that we tend to make things go faster because we're humans well um, there's there's this, oh hold on mercedes let me let me ask you about this real quick just uh, your take on climate change because i think it's safe to say climates change yes. radically affecting humanity by nature it's also fair to say human pollution is significant enough to affect it the yes. question is is it this massive existential crisis that will never engineer our way out of that dooms the planet because we're ruining the the, the atmosphere I and that as, i think is harder to believe i think as long as boomers are in charge we will always have anxiety about our earth and that's just all there is to it and so i think as until yeah, we get boomers better drugs. <laughs> Until boomers are retired and feel safe in us to relinquish the reins to get us. All up. Oh my Shrooms, god. No anxiety. We're gonna, I don't we're, know. We're, we're I don't know what it's gonna take night. for the grown-ups to understand that we too are grown-ups. <laughs> but um some affordable housing and lower inflation would be great in addition to this existential crisis of the climate. But other than that, I think that we just need to be mindful as youths until the boomers are out, and then we'll all just just, and well, you're a ger geriatric, geriatric millennial. I'm just a pioneer of the internet millennial. They are subdividing us now. All right. Um, the next yeah. story in our stack on Mental Health Monday, Loveland Teen works to advocate for and destigmatize mental health. Caitlin Tollison has been interested in mental health since middle school. Mercedes, why does this story give you hope? because if our future is already adequate like acutely aware that mental health is really fucking important it's going to make communication in the future a lot easier especially like when we become the boomers and these whoa i'm not used to it being this close so like we uh as us we become the boomers and now they're the millennials they're gonna be on a more just we're watching human evolution and and yeah science yeah, is so, evolving and so the way I, I pointed this out in the past is that uh while you can say oh my god people are going crazy because we're taking more drugs than ever before more pharmaceutical psycho whatever's and we have more mental health diagnoses it's like yeah it just means all that shit was going undiagnosed in prior generations it's not a product of people becoming crazier there are short-term trends like several mm. like COVID. COVID is a short-term trend of people becoming crazier, right? Or having more mental I mean, health. I think but the long-term trend is we have more leisure time, more time to pay attention to our mental health. And what you're saying is that that is now manifest with this story in a generational way where you see a huge evolution in stigmatism going away. With a, with a I, I, th I think today's kids are, for better or for worse, for all the things, oh, millennials, this, that, but even the, the Zers coming up, they seem a lot more comfortable just talking about shit. Kyle Kinane has a bit about this. He's like, well, in the Midwest, you know, it was a big deal coming from the Midwest to the LA where people like casually talk about therapy. They just drop it into a conversation at lunch. Well, I was talking to my therapist the other day and you're like, Shh, they're going to think you're crazy. Cause you know, in the Midwest, we just, we, 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 we take all of our problems and we bundle them up. And we stuff them down, 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 down. And then we drink. We drink all the drinks until, and then one day you just see a picture of your family and for no reason. You just punch it and you don't know why. And it's like, yeah, he's I making fun of. Do you need you know, a cookie? <laughs> I, that was a bad Kyle Kinane impersonation. I'm sorry you didn't get that whole thing with me trying to do a Kyle Kinane bit. Okay. Uh, but the difference in mental health attitudes from Midwest to LA also represents. I think that generational difference where it's like, yeah, therapy, of course, yeah, I've, I've done therapy. I've done, I've done relationship therapy. I've done individual therapy. I've done PTSD therapy. I've done cannabis therapy. I've done psilocybin and, 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 you know, uh, ayahuasca therapy. And it's like, yeah, I get it. My, and we talk, we we're getting to the point where talking about your mental health can be as comfortable as talking about your physical health. We don't go to therapy because we're sick. We don't go to the gym because we're sick. We go to the gym because we're not as strong as we could be. We want to be stronger. We want to be fitter. We want to be healthier. We want to live longer. We want to be happier. And looking at therapy the same way, I think, is a major uh, evolutionary leap. Yeah. Uh, yes. God bless America. I don't want this. I was going to bring this up. There was another article I had shared 
that didn't make it in the block that had actual like data about Colorado and their mental health crisis that's going on. And it's important to note like why I added that one in is because this one, because they're talking as legislature body in Colorado about um, the kids and what's going on. Where are my numbers? Oh, and it was, there it is. And it says, th th this article from Sky High News, it says Children's Hospital Colorado declares mental health state of emergency as suicide attempts rise. Um, and it's this part that I wanted to highlight. It said, um, in Summit County, where the community is fed up with uh, mourning many youth suicides in recent years, um, including the death, death of an 11 year old in 2017, residents pay into a mental health fund that finances therapy for anyone who needs it but can't afford it. As of April, the community was paying for therapy for 87 children. That's more mental health vouchers than were issued for kids in all of 2020, said the commissioner. So it's good to see the older kids raising the alarm because the younger kids are already eating themselves. And my community has this issue specifically. We have a very high suicide rate in our youth and we, we have for years and we, we're starting to fix it. So it's nice to see that this is, you know, we got a, a few quick fun stories we got to get through here for the mental health block. Eyewitness News 7, ABC, how inmates are helping others struggling with mental illness mm -hmm. behind bars at downtown LA jail. Love it. Yep. I mean, it's like, it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a flower growing through a crack in a sidewalk uh, or a government bunker. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, this is just a beautiful story of humanity connecting amidst un, uh, uh, untold tragedy. It's showing that the government can't do anything right, even when people are locked up. And that, that one study where they were like, inmates can't govern themselves was rigged. We know it's rigged because these inmates are proving the system wrong and take care, taking care of themselves. And the government's listening to them and letting them do the model for it. One is concerning because they're inmates. So this goes into that efficacy of scientific testing on inmates because they're correctional people. Two. Yeah, so this is, this is so this, the story. is good. It's has great like two story. big contradictions great. right here. Yeah. Roughly 2,800 inmates are behind bars at the Twin Towers Correctional Facility in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. All of them men struggling with mental illness. And then the next sentence. In fact, it's the nation's largest mental health facility. No, it's not. It's a government jail. It's a correction. And it's like, holy shit. Mm, that's what I mean is oh, the, they're doing the, a good like, thing. This is, this is the modern version of the, okay, so humanity is still evolving. And this is still a sign overall of getting better. What did we used to do with crazy people who were a threat to our tribe? Someone starts going crazy and they might tip off the enemy or a lion in the grass. What do you, you fucking kill them? Kill them. Just, a kid is crazy like you kill him because that, that was that was the world we lived in until we had the social security not the program the literal definition of those words the social security the economic security to to include crazy people you know people who are liability crazy in our in our communities you know we needed that and we've gotten to this and then it was well we'll shuffle them off to some asylums and they'll get experimented on we'll just tuck them away in the corners of industrialized society. And now it's, well, we'll just let government handle them. Yeah, we have nowhere else to go. My mom, my mother told me once, cause we were talking about this while she was in law school. I'm like, I, cause she was a corrections officer before she went to law school. Um, and uh, she's like, there's no, there's nowhere else for them to go. This is, this, the system drops the crack on all these well, people. In, in DC from even my experience living there, it was in the winter, crazy homeless dudes can't eat. Jail and can't stay warm, they okay. will get arrested to go to jail for the winter. Yeah, so this is one of the puppies, since we're talking about heavy, good topics. Aww. I figured puppies hey. fix everything. So, oh, here, yeah, here, oh. Their eyes are open, they opened today. I woke up to open eye puppies, so. Aww. There's one of them. Aww, what a beautiful puppy. I'm not sure if I'm getting pooped on or if that's the mom farting, but this is one Aww. of the females. So. Know, well, we're waiting on our last litter of kittens here any yes. moment now. Yeah. But uh, yes, to the next story, yeah. we, we have a couple. We, we do have some good ones to get to, although this one's a little weird. Wall Street Journal, suddenly wealthy from markets. Some millennials are stressed. Well, here's the world's smallest violin for your wealth stress. 
After NASDAQ and Bitcoin rallies, young investors weigh options for what to do with their money. I just thought it would be worth touching on Mercedes since we have this bifurcation of the economy happening where, I mean, I consider myself, you know, happy poor. You know, I own my home. It's a $13,000 piece of land. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a long-haired country boy who managed to, I, I can afford to get stoned in the morning and drunk in the afternoon. And I got no money, but I damn sure got it made. You know, there's this new perspective so on wealth and the modern economy. And I'm kind of like, man, I'm really happy being functionally poor. Rather, I mean, is, is it impossible to have, because when you say wealth, if it's in money or stocks or even insignificant real estate, those aren't, that's not real wealth. You have government credits. Holding government credits has got to come with some stress. Yeah. I, uh, before we, because we own our home, well, we have a loan on our home, so the bank owns it, but we're paying it off, right? <laughs> Thanks, at least, but it's not an apartment. It's ours. We don't have a landlord. It's our home. Uh, I will say that has taken the anxiety burden off, but I'm functionally poor as poor as well. I have everything I need. I have nothing more. I couldn't read the entire story, unfortunately, because there's a paywall. Oh, it's Wall Street Journal. Man. And I'm functionally I like poor. <laughs> and I did my free <laughs> so It's a way already. to raise this idea, you know, that, that this is the reason I'm bringing the story into it. Because the story is more, actually, I skimmed it. It goes more into... You know, like investors who Bitcoin and like like actual. Aside from the crypto the thing, is if you're rich with crypto, the anxiety is the instability of the crypto itself, right? You know, you want to buy peace of mind. Wealth is not stress. It's it's who holds your credits. What form is that wealth in? If it's your health, you know, hey, no stress by definition, right? I mean, until that's directly threatened by vaccine mandates. Uh, but if it's in if it's in U.S. dollars in a bank account, <clears throat> in order for you to be wealthy, you have to maintain government's permission for you to be wealthy. In order for me to have a bucket of gold or silver, let you know, buried in my land, I don't need anybody's permission for that. What That's, silver? Yeah, or what? what were you, I don't know what, what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. What is gold? Uh, yeah, no, that's just it. Is that you have people need to be aware of real value, real property, and like asset property and stuff like that and liquidable little assets and non-liquidable assets and other things that they make you go to college to learn because they want to monetize that knowledge to keep us poor. All right. Finally, yeah. the fun good news in our Mental Health Monday block from Reuters. Mike Tyson says psychedelics saved yeah. his life. Now he hopes they can change the world. There is going to be a flood of stories like this it's, so time. it's time we are on the verge we are we are in the middle of the end of the war on drugs do you want to play do you want to play that video that mike tyson is that him talking about this i think we should do it because like when you think about psychedelics and what they do for your brain as like a member of the psychedelic caucus i know joey is as well um they help fix some of those neuroreceptors that are damaged from getting bashed in the head repeatedly from his profession specifically so oh, like yeah. this this is really cool for like people with mental like with brain trauma because brain trauma can create ptsd and anxiety and depression. i know this is a, this is a weird hypothetical here but you, you talk about that i think uh, not just about boxers, but professional football players and yes. athletes experience regular head trauma. And I'll spare you my long-term bitch rugby. rant about football versus rugby. But um, <laughs> rugby's a real man sport. Football's not. There you go. But I have a lot. Thank you. Good summary. Right. But I have I have a lot of sympathy for football players, and I admit that the better athletes are follow the money. You know, the, the, by and large, yeah, the football. Uh, while less athletic of a sport has better athletes and they are being led in a lot of fucked up ways to bang their heads with helmets into each other and, and have long-term health consequences. I wonder, are we going to be able to beat the shit out of each other more if our answer is instead of, oh yeah, you're just going to be senile at 50 as opposed to 90 now. It's, hey, oh, you ha after a football game, you had a concussion. Did you, did you get, did you get back? Take a day off to do some shrooms and come back to practice on Tuesday. Maybe that's why we were so much more tough before, because that's what we did. We went and did shrooms <laughs> about it. Like, gladiator, oh, I just, you know, oh. You know, <laughs> this conversation is, about it. this is making me as happy as if I would have done shrooms. Do we have that Mike Tyson video ready? 
<laughs> because, yeah. It's magic. That's why I'm talking to you the way I am. Let's not forget that. In his prime, Mike Tyson was the most feared man to put on a set of boxing gloves, obliterating his opponents with ruthless efficiency. But underneath the tough exterior was a man at war with himself, battling an abusive voice in his battered head that led Iron Mike to the brink of suicide. He says all that changed when he began taking psilocybin mushrooms, more commonly known as magic mushrooms, and other similar consciousness-altering substances. I can't even tell you what situation... Um, what mental issues I used to have. I told you, man, I was in the sick house. Everybody thought I was crazy. I bit this guy beer off. I did all this stuff. And then once I got um, introduced to um, um, the shrooms and the um, the toad and all those psilocybin, um, my whole life changed. I started boxing. Look, look what I'm doing now. <laughs> now, the soon to be 55 year old boxing prodigy, cannabis entrepreneur, and podcast host from Brooklyn is experiencing a career renaissance that he said is the result of psilocybin-powered mental and spiritual exploration. It's like a dream. I think somebody's going to wake me up and say, get your back in that cell or something. <laughs> it's just, um, it's just an amazing medicine that people don't look at for the perspective that it needs to be looked into. Psilocybin is increasingly being taken seriously as a psychiatric medicine, though medical professionals studying them warn against self-medicating to avoid unwanted side effects like disturbing hallucinations, anxiety, and panic. Like Tyson, former NHL enforcer Daniel Carcillo, who was nicknamed Car Bomb for his violent approach to the sport before he retired, the Cybin. He says that the drugs also help in treating traumatic brain injury in athletes and is hopeful that it gets FDA approved someday soon. I think it's really important to um, have a medical diagnosis and, and have this be delivered, um, you know, through the medical system and covered by insurance. But I think, you know, me and Mike have both accessed this medicine um, outside of that. So it would be, um, you know, it wouldn't be right for us to not also advocate for like decriminalized nature and, and getting people access to this. This is where we are, people. This is pretty, uh, how many more stories? How many more stories? All right, since it's Memorial Day, we're gonna say fuck militarism as hard and fast as possible by skimming through our militarism block of headlines today from the New York Post. Killer drone hunted down a human target without being told to. Oh, it was a drone, because it's an unmanned aerial vehicle when the U.S. military does it. The Jerusalem Post. Israel's operation against Hamas was the world's first AI war. We figured out a really, really smart way to do some really, really dumb, violent shit. You really going to brag about that? You, you had AI, and you didn't use it to, like, say, figure out how to prevent the war? Maybe... You wanted it to happen. The IDF used artificial intelligence and supercomputing during the last conflict with Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Yeah, okay. Uh, Russia from uh, StarAdvertiser.com. Russian spy ship operating, operating off Kuwai, Navy, Navy confirms. Now, a <clears throat> real simple part of this story, just to make a point. A Russian spy ship parked in international waters off Kuwai for several days has delayed a military defense agency missile test. The U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor said in a statement that it is aware of the Russian vessel operating in international waters in the vicinity of Hawaii and will continue to track it through the duration of its time here. Through maritime patrol aircraft, surface ships, and joint cap capabilities, we can closely monitor all vessels in the Indo-Pacific area of operation. So why did that delay a missile defense agency missile test? Oh, we were going to do it, but if the Russians are looking, we're not going to do it. Really? We still put up with this shit? Washington Times, showdown! U.S. NATO wage war games in Europe, Russia to send troops west. Yeah, uh, just another hot spot to look forward to covering in the future as it heats up. KTLA 5. Now we have uh, our quick grab, a couple Jewish stories. Uh, Anti-Semitism, or at least the appearance of it making uh, an insurgence here. Investigation underway after Vandal hurls concrete slab at West 
L.A. synagogue. And then we have a very implausible story that strikes me as one of these fake hate crime stories. I don't know. I leave it to you. Look it up in the notes. Tell me what you think. NBCNewYork.com with this headline. New York City EMT says he was beaten for being Jewish during Vegas vacation. Because we all know drunk tourists in Las Vegas are a hotbed of anti-Semitic violent uh, retaliation for whatever it is they're doing in, in, in Gaza. Uh, but no, he said, your people are not going to exist anymore. I said, you can tell me what that means. My people, Lee Woods tell, told NBC New York, which the other man replied, the Jews are not going to exist anymore. Sounds like they're random drunken ravings of an idiot uh, rather than a thoughtful hate crime, if, if there is such a thing. NBCnews.com, Republicans block independent commission to investigate attack on U.S. Capitol. It's an attack, not a false flag insurgency, apparently. Uh, but yes, two quick stories still from January 6th. The House passed legislation at dead end in the Senate due to Republican opposition led by Senator Mitch McConnell. Meanwhile, Reuters, four more Oath Keepers indicted in January 6th federal conspiracy case. Also, Salon.com, Roger Stone predicts a Donald Trump criminal indictment is on the horizon. Might be time to have Roger Stone on again and get his take on the Stone says it's another witch hunt, though many disagree with that assessment. And from The Guardian, random grab bag story, number of smokers has reached all-time high of 1.1 billion. Study finds governments told to focus on stopping young from taking up habit that killed 8 million people in 2019. And it makes you wonder, is there going to be, are we going to fix tobacco? Are we, are we going to get to a way of using it as a thoughtful sacrament as opposed to a, you know, stress relieving, soothing kind of drug and uh, stop doing it with, with chemicals. Can we do it in a way that, that at least moderates the, you know, the, the, the safety of it in a, in a positive way? Why are humans so irresistibly drawn to tobacco? Maybe there's a reason we have yet to fully understand. And with that, Jim Freedom, give us the producer. Actually, sorry, I'm sorry, order wrong. Mercedes, give us the winner of today's comment contest. To the today's winners is Los. They had a comment earlier when our guest was on or right, right before about big pharma or yeah, pharma having it, our best interests at heart. I cannot pull it back up. I cannot even find it when I went to the YouTube aunt did respond to it. It was real, real funny. So Los, if you're still watching, please, um, if you would either recomment it or just message us. I think that you win today because that was really funny. It was the funniest government expense joke today because I hate big pharma, especially <laughs> when they come after my weeds and my state government. And I'm not even going to get into it. We don't have time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. <laughs> to get plugged in as the winner of a Producers Club membership for today's comment contest, email jim at thefreedomline.com, who will be coming up right now to give us the producer notes to take us home on the show. What's going on? Congratulations to the winner. Yes, email me there, Jim. It's freedomline.com. I'll get you hooked up. Anybody who didn't win can still join us on the public channel at t.me forward slash Adam versus the man. So uh, download Telegram, get involved with that, and try to enjoy tomorrow's contest and win tomorrow's contest. Or just buy your way on patreon.com forward slash Adam versus the man. 10 bucks a month to get you access to the private producers club that the contest winner just won access to. After that, you can you get 15% off and free shipping on everything at the store. Cigarfederation.com is an awesome website that we give 10% off with a promo code of Adam10. Instagram tag is at the Garden of Freedom. Bunch of cool pictures and videos. Definitely check that out. The Crypto Six needs your help. Check that out. And go greenenergyonline.com, the best website for do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the West if I have to do it, I come in at the wrong second, but we'll get there. I got. I could play. Well, I'll just. Anybody else backstage? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we go to goodnewsnetwork.org for this day in history. <clears throat> and I got to say, they're not doing a good job. 
It's like this same history in bad news. 200 years ago today, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, also called the Baltimore Basilica, became the first Roman Catholic cathedral built in the United States. So more money was diverted from serving God's alleged purposes of helping the poor and needy and instead, instead to architecture to glorify the church. Yeah, I, I have a hard time calling that good news. Also, a hard time calling it good news that it was on this day in 1790. The U.S. enacted its first copyright statute. Yeah. To now, there, uh, the way I would say it would be to institutionalize the racket of intellectual property and to use violence of government to impede the free flow of ideas. You see, it's not really good news not to protect the works of creative authors and the literary blah, 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 blah. Also, Big Ben, the world's largest four faced clock, started ticking on this day in 1859. Isn't that a government thing? The Soviet Union signed an agreement pledging to respect. For outer or respect for outer Mongolia as sovereign to China on this day in 1924. I, I guess that was good news. Anyway, with that, mwah, peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other.